Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Gracious God, you are true love. And where love is, you dwell in the midst of us. Would you call us to be people of love for one another, people proud and, and bold to proclaim your goodness in the world and those who worship you in spirit and in truth with all of our might and all of our being and all of our joy, for you are worthy of our praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In the Gospel of John this morning, we hear Jesus say, Where I am going, you cannot come. Now, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as a slightly strange statement because just eight verses later in John chapter 14, Jesus says that he's going to prepare a place for us so that where he is, we could be there also. And he even tells his disciples that they know how to get there because he is the way, the truth, and the life. So what exactly does Jesus mean just eight verses earlier when he says he's going to a place where they cannot come just before he says, come be with me? Well, the answer to that question is clear. Some of you may have already figured it out, but I don't want us to blow past it without considering the deep implications of it. When Jesus says, you cannot go where I am going, what does he mean? He means to the cross, because Jesus Christ goes to the cross alone. In verse 33 of today's reading from John's Gospel, he tells his little children, it's the only time he ever refers to them as technia, as little kids, his precious family. He says, little children, you cannot join me up on that tree. Dying for the sins of the world is God's job, and he takes it on willingly out of love for you and out of love for me. The vocation of the Lamb of God is to be slain for the sake of the sins of the whole world, and that is God's task. It is not our task. It makes me think of the number of times someone will come into my office and, and talk about their sins and their struggles, and um, I'll watch them leave the room just as burdened as when they walked in, and then just say, listen, if we don't leave our sins at the foot of the cross then we're acting like we're Jesus for ourselves. We've got to let the Lord take away our sin and our shame because Jesus goes to that cross alone. We cannot join Him in His passion, but we are invited to join Him in His victory. He died alone so that we might live together with Him. And that, my friends, in a nutshell the glory of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to give you another way to think about this truth. Do you remember back in the garden that there were actually two trees planted at the center of the garden? One of them was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other tree was the tree of life. And after Adam and Eve ate of the first tree, God kicked them out of the garden to prevent them from eating from the second tree. Do you remember that part of the story? Now, it's not as if God didn't want them to have eternal life. He just did not want them to live eternally in a state of separation from Him. If they had eaten of that second tree while in a state of shame and separation, then they would have lived forever as the eternally damned. And so it begins to make sense as we read the New Testament and we start seeing the tree of life crop up again, no pun intended, as the tree is made available to us in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, we begin to see how this story seamlessly completes itself 
in the Lord. And my friends, that is a mighty idea, isn't it? That the tree of life was forbidden to us after the fall so that we might not live lives as those eternally lost. And yet, in Jesus, the doorway to that tree is opened up for us again when and only after Jesus has redeemed us. And if you ever want to really get a grasp on that truth, just go Google search for images of the tree of life in the history of the church's art. Often you'll see the tree with a cross emerging from its bark. And the fruit that hangs on that tree, can you guess what it is? It's the body and blood of our Savior that is the fruit of of that tree. Is, is that, I mean, I don't know about you, but to me, that is such a glorious thing to ponder that the cross of Christ was in the garden from the very beginning because he always knew, even before the fall, that his love for creation was so great that he would redeem it all the way to the death on the cross alone, rejected and despised by his own. So hear Jesus say again, little children, you cannot go with me to that cross. But I love you enough to go there on my own. And if I go there, then I prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you might be also. And where is that? It's in the presence of God. It's under the sheltering limbs of the very tree of life. So with today's first question answered, I want us to now close by asking, so what? In light of God's great sacrifice for us, how are we supposed to respond? While we cannot get up on that tree with Him, we do hear Him inviting us to eat of the fruit of that tree and to thereby live lives that are completely covered in His grace. So what do those kinds of lives look like? We know that He is the bread of life. We know that He is the water of salvation. What does it mean to drink of Him and eat of His feast? How does that feast change us? We know that He's given us His Spirit, and He wants us to live lives of power and grace and hope and mission. What do those kinds of lives look Well, our readings from Scripture today are full of direction, and I want to point out just three of the marching orders that we find in God's Word today, things to do and ways to be if we want to be and long to be and desire to be His precious people, His little children, His church in the world. Our first marching order can also be found in John's Gospel. And as soon as Jesus is done telling them that He's going to the cross alone, He gives them a commandment. And that commandment is to love one another as they have first been loved. Now, remember, this story comes right after the foot washing. So they've been given this example of love. And little do they know that they were about to get a far more profound example of what it means to love as we have been loved. To love one another in Jesus' terms is nothing shallow. There's nothing warm and fuzzy about this kind of love. This is a commandment, friends, to do the hard work of laying down our lives for one another, for suffering with one another, to sacrifice ourselves one for the other. This is the commandment to give of our time and our resources, our energies to build one another up and not to tear one another down, to weep with one another, to rejoice with one another, to care for one another as the very family of God. This is a commandment to reach out to the world in all we do with costly love, 
This is the time you spend mentoring a child in need. This is the time that you spend fighting for the needs of the poor. This is the time you spend caring for the alien and the orphan and the least among us, even when it costs us. And Jesus tells us in verse 33 that the world will know us. He'll know that we're His disciples and how we love one another. He then goes to the cross to show us exactly what it means to love each other. And that's to sacrifice ourselves for others even when they do not deserve it. While we cannot go to the cross with Jesus, we can live like those who have been transformed by it, like those who are being fed by the God of life and are thus empowered to love others in His name. Our second marching order can be found in our reading from Revelation, which is full of a singular commandment. I don't know if you heard it over and over again, but it is a command to praise God to praise the one who is worthy of praise, to glorify the God who went alone to that cross so that we might be with Him. Did you know that this is the only place in the New Testament where the word Alleluia appears? I kind of found that surprising. You find it throughout the Old Testament, but it's almost as if the New Testament was arranged to wait to the very end of all that has been said to say Alleluia. And Alleluia is an exhortation. It is a Hebrew word that says, stand up, friends, get on your knees, friends, and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verses 1 and 4 and 6 all say it. Alleluia. It's a commandment to be people of praise. And that this text is not done giving us that exhortation. In verse 5, we hear a voice coming from the throne of God. And what does it say? Praise the Lord, all you His servants, small and great, all you who fear Him. Praise Him. He's worthy of praise. And these commandments that we're supposed to praise God are all given with the sense that we will know true joy. We should expect to know true joy when indeed we are praising Him. Look at verse 7. It says, Rejoice as you exalt in the Lord. Verse 9 says that if you have the praise of God on your lips, then you are blessed. You are a blessed person. And why? Because you've been invited to the greatest party that the world has ever known. The marriage supper, woohoo, is right. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Who doesn't want to go to that party? And I want you to imagine as you kneel at this rail that you're getting a foretaste of what that feast is to be. I shared with someone this week who came to see me that sometimes I find people in tears as they receive the bread and drink of the wine. Some people are just grinning ear to ear. And both responses to the marriage supper of the Lamb are utterly appropriate. Tears that the Lord has loved us this much and rejoicing and smiles that He has welcomed us to this feast. Why would we not want to praise the Lord? Sunday after Sunday, morning after morning, evening prayer after evening prayer. Have any of you seen this sarcastic article that's been floating around Facebook the last few weeks where there's this couple that is lamenting the fact that their kids have lost their faith? They've gone off to college and they've totally spun out of control and they're not exhibiting any evidence that the Lord's at work in their lives. So as you start reading the article, you know, you feel a lot of sympathy for them. And then the couple begins to complain that they worked so hard to, to get their kids grounded in the biblical story by having them at church at least once a year. And, they, and you're like, you, you get it now, right? And, you're like, and they're like, why did it not stick? And they begin to complain about the teachers and the preaching. And they go, they were wailing out to God. We worship the God of the universe whenever it was convenient. That's the way they phrased it, right? There wasn't a sporting event in the way. There wasn't a school function in the way. There wasn't a hard test the next morning. There wasn't a family vacation coming up. 
You get the point. Brutal irony, right? That calls us all to account for the ways that we take the worship of God less seriously than we are, A, commanded to, and B, more importantly, are invited to. There's a joy in coming to the altar of God. There's a richness to it. There's a depth to it. it. It should be full of rapture. It should be full of transport. It should be transforming us always with excitement that this is where we belong. This should be the place that we want to be. And church is not a spectator sport. It's a full body exercise of being what we were created to be the people who worship God, the people who celebrate Him, the people who are graced to know Him. This is the high point of our human existence. And while we cannot go to the cross with Jesus, we can live like those who have been transformed by it, like those who have been fed by the God of life and who desire nothing more passionately than a chance to worship Him in spirit, and in truth. Our third marching order can be found in our reading from the Acts of the Apostles, and it is a commandment to preach the gospel in season and out of season, everywhere that we go, in everything that we do. In verse 46, we are reminded that it is necessary for us to proclaim the Word of God to the Israelites which is a whole series of sermons that may be laying in the future for us. In verse 47, we are commanded to be a light to the nations, to be the church of God, bringing every nation, tribe, and tongue into the fold of those who worship the Lord. In verse 57, we are reminded that whether the Word of God takes root through our proclamation or not, sharing the news of Jesus should fill us with joy and with celebration and with the Holy Spirit. My friends, there is deep happiness in doing the work that we're commanded to do, to go forth and preach the gospel and to baptize others in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know how easy it is to read those passages and think that those are about Paul and Barnabas, right? Or to read the very end of Matthew and that great commission and assume that that commandment was given to Andrew and Damon. Um, but that's not the truth. That commandment is given to you, not to the professional proclaimers of the gospel. We are your shepherds. We are your priests. We've been given the charge to shepherd you but it is not so that you can remain sheep. It's so that you can be trained to be the shepherds of the flocks that God has granted you in your homes, in your workplaces, um, on your sports teams, in the life that you live out in the world where you're reaching out to flocks that the professionals can't reach. We shepherd you so that you can shepherd the world. There's a commandment to do that. And that's what it means to realize that we cannot go to the cross with Jesus, but we can. And we must live like those who have been transformed by it, who are being fed by the God of life, and then go forth from this place as the baptized, to baptize others with joy in every walk of life in which we find ourselves. Let me close this morning with this charge. Love, worship, and preach. Love, worship, and preach, my friends. Christ went to the cross alone so that you and I will never be alone again. And if we are together with Him, then His Spirit fills us and we're invited to live lives of newness. Not the old life of the flesh, but the new life of His grace. And if we live that way, then we are to love like we have been loved. We are to worship with all of our being. And we are to preach like there is no tomorrow. My friends, the tree of life has been offered to you. Eat of it and live. 
And then, in the name of Christ, offer the fruit of that tree, Jesus Himself, to the whole world. Amen.